are so thrilled to have uh, Professor David Gergen here with us today. He was a chief speechwriter uh, under uh, in the Nixon administration, and then he served as the director of communications in the Ford administration, in the Reagan administration, as a counselor to President Clinton, and is currently a professor of public policy at the Kennedy School and a co-director of the Center on Public Leadership. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Arup. Glad to be here. So I want to start off talking about presidential image. A lot of your career uh, as uh, the director of communications, you know, crafting an image of the president for the public, something you witnessed early on in the Nixon administration when really TV was getting going. That was really successful, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> well, there was a lot to manage there. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it, it, with the Trump administration, it seems like he simultaneously cares a lot about it, but cares very little about it in the sense that he seems so insecure about getting respect and praise, but at the same time, he just does whatever he wants. How do you, what do you think is going on there? Well, I don't think anybody knows for sure what's going on <coughs> inside the Trump White House or indeed inside Mr. Trump's head. But <coughs> let's go back to the main point, and that is a uh, presidential image, which I think has been far overdone as a concept or is as being central to a president's success. Uh, much more central, and, and this is the image as part of it. Uh, you have to go all the way back to um, the, the founder of the Kennedy School, sort of the, the iconic figure of the Kennedy School, and a book on presidential power written by Richard Neustadt. In his book, which is classic, he argued that the power of the president is the power to persuade. Yes, there are constitutional responsibilities that come with the presidency, but if you want to move the system, if you want to get the votes, if you want to move other nations, uh, you have to have persuasive power. You know, <clears throat> Jimmy Carter showed us, for example, as president, uh, that you can come up with terrific ideas. You know, ideas are on the shelf. Of, of most presidents. There are a lot of them out there. They're in all the think tanks. But it's the capacity to execute or to trans take the idea and transform it into action, to persuade people to go along with you, uh, that's very, very important. And does image matter for that? Yes. Image goes into building up your level of public support so that Donald Trump um, is, is suffering in part uh, because of all the chaos that's going on, in the sense that they don't quite, you know, they don't have their act together yet, uh, and his ego and all the rest of that, we, those are all very familiar. But the problem he's had now is he's not been able to get beyond his base so yeah. far. And so as long as he's uh, holding on only to the base in politics, what you want to do is essentially build from your base out so that you have more than half the country supporting you. And Donald Trump now only has the base, and he has his, his support levels have been in the the 30s and even low, low 40s, but that's very low, is especially it, at this part of the presidency. Is it, what does he need to do to persuade the American public on his ideas? Well, he, he has to have, it would help him right now uh, to get a win or two in Congress and to, and to show that the win is leading to change in people's lives. They're, he's going to ultimately be judged by his own base, of whether he delivers on jobs, whether he delivers on the health care promises he made, whether he delivers on, on various other ways on immigration and all the other kind of issues they seem to care so much about. <clears throat> and that is going to be part of it. Is is in there already, the Trump people, you know, their message frequently is he's a man who keeps his promises. He has a long list of promises he made to his base. He's executing. And you have to say, he has been fairly faithful to a lot of the ideas in the, in the campaign. But that only gets his base. <clears throat> a lot of the rest of the country is looking for, well, wait a minute, you're, but your, your health care idea is to use to gut Medicaid over time, take the money that you're using to support the poor, uh, and 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 give away pet tax breaks to the to the affluent. Is that really something that we want to embrace as a as a country, as a people? A lot of other Americans, I here in Cambridge, those are the kind of questions that you you run into everywhere. A large part of persuasion also seems like getting the media on board, sure. in a sense, and. You know, being able to get them to deliver your ideas right. or to so or give you a fair break. Yeah, and and the relationship with the media is is pretty bad. Awful. But but it's been bad before with other, other presidents. In fact, you were you know you were uh, in the White House and during the early years of the Clinton administration when the, when the media relationship was was pretty horrible. Uh, I remember they they cut off access very briefly to D.D. Myers and uh, George Stephanopoulos. Uh, and I know that there was a. Um, you know, just just a lot of turmoil in those early few months. Sure, uh, I, I, so things can turn around. Can, they can turn around. I was um, I was on the outside in, in the beginning of the Clinton administration. He he was someone I had known for a while, uh, and we had we had a friendship. And he he was having trouble with the press, and he called me and asked me to come in about six months into the administration, 
And one of the issues he wanted me to focus on was the relationship with the press. He had others. He would want to be more bipartisan. He wanted to do better with outreach into Washington, D.C. He wanted to build a lot of the basic foundations for a successful presidency. Uh, and one of the first things we did with, with his support uh, was to open things up, you know, open doors that were closed, yeah. open up briefings, be more transparent. Now, this, for me, is pretty fundamental to my experiences in the White House. My first White House uh, was with Richard Nixon, right. <clears throat> who was very paranoid. And it's been said that even paranoids had, have real enemies. So he did have some real enemies, but we ran a very close shop. And, of course, as it, as it turned out, as I learned later on, how much lying had gone on. Um, but that was that was part of his downfall, that he had hit, that he operated in so much secrecy, and you know if they they had let more sunlight in, a bit more disinfectant in, yeah. I think he'd been more successful president. But you contrast that then with another president I worked for, Ronald Reagan, who came into Washington as the most conservative president we'd had since the 1920s, and the press was very skeptical of him. They thought he was a cowboy. Um, they thought, you know, Clark Clifford famously called him a dunce at Georgetown Clark cocktail parties. And it turned out he was a very effective leader. Now, one of the reasons he was effective was he believed in having a very professional relationship with the press. Yes, you're not going to win every argument, but if you respect them and what they do, they'll respect you. But you have to treat them as professionals, and you have to let them have, an, have enough information. So we, we did not only briefings every day, but every week. When I came in, when I came in, we, were, we developed a system. Every week, you'd sit down at least for half an hour or an hour mm -hmm. with each one of the news magazines, with each one. And Jim Baker, chief of staff, would do that you know, with, with uh, real discipline to talk to the New York Times, talk to the Washington Post, bring them in, help them understand. You'd, that doesn't mean you spill all the secrets, but it does mean you have a respectful relationship. Is that, is that your greatest concern with the Trump administration? <coughs> no. The, my greatest concern with the tr Trump administration is whether we're going to wander into a war. Really? Yes. And uh, you see it as which we're talking about, North Korea? Uh, well, well, you, can, you, can so you, can, you can choose your hot spot. Really? North Korea is one of them. Yeah. Certainly the Baltics could be another. Right. Um, I, I think we're moving toward a better place with the South China Sea. Right. But I think what we have in President Trump is someone who is not only inexperienced, um, but is erratic and volatile. And you never know with his temperament if he's going to lash out. We know that through yeah. the tweets. And that's a pattern that in a president can be quite dangerous. Yeah. I mean, you are the commander in chief. You can't push buttons now. Yeah. Fortunately, he's assembled a very good national security team. You know, once he got Flynn out and brought McMaster in, that was a great change for the better. And he's and Jim Mattis at Secretary of Defense. He's got some strong people now. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm hopeful there. But I would tell you, in the Nixon days, when the thing when he got very erratic toward the end, he was right. drinking heavily. Um, his defense secretary, Jim Schlesinger, a very bright man, called the military and said, "If you get an order from President Nixon." to fire missiles. You do not fire until you come to me and get my personal sign-off or get the personal sign-off of the Secretary of State. You have to have one or the other. That was entirely outside the constitutional right. system. Yes, but it protected the country. Right. Because you don't know if you have an erratic person. And, uh, you know, I pray to God, you know, President Trump will have yeah. a, uh, you know, I'd like to see him, you know, frankly, yeah. do good things for the country. But I, I, I worry more about that than anything else. So you were a speechwriter. In, you were in the speechwriting shop in the Nixon administration. Right I at ran the, the speechwriting shop. You ran the speechwriting shop. Could you see, I mean, were you able to, were you witnessing his alcoholism and his, uh, his paranoia? Was that something you saw firsthand? <coughs> more and, and more. It was, I was young when I first came to the White House. I was just a kid, just, got, just out of the law school here right. and out of the Navy. And uh, when I first came, I, what I saw was the bright side of Richard Nixon, yeah. and he had a very bright side, and I saw, you yeah. know, the public side inside the White House. But as he came to trust me, then he let his guard down, yeah. and I saw the raw side, and, oh, he had a language. Does, I, did, I've been in the military, but I had never heard language like that. Did, I mean, does the stuff, does it feel like Watergate? There have been days when it's definitely felt like Watergate. And I do think we'll have to wait and see. I think we should be very cautious about drawing firm conclusions now. Yeah. We don't. Let's let the evidence be assembled. It yeah. takes a long time, uh, and it's unfair to the individuals involved to to, to to find them guilty. You know, to have a hanging first and then find to have the trial. Yeah, everyone's, uh, say, everyone's saying that the, the White House staff should, should lawyer up. You got to get lawyered up right sure, now. Sure, wh you do. What does it mean? It doesn't sound like a lot of fun. What does it mean to get lawyered up? Well, I had to do it during the Clinton administration. I, ex I had to go out and hire a personal lawyer at my expense, and it ran into the tens of thousands of dollars. To just protect you from? I had to go up and testify about events that happened before I got there. 
really. About events that happened before I got there, and I, because they wanted to know what were you told when you came in, what did you understand, and so forth and so, or so on. But I had to have a lawyer to go do that. I had to have a lawyer, you know, if the FBI was going to come around to come. Before I got into the Clinton administration, I never had to hire a lawyer. Yeah. Today it's not. It's Even, it, even in Watergate? Do you, uh, no, no, I didn't. Because I, I was so junior, I didn't, you know, I was not. I had a relationship with Bob Woodward and was talking to him. That's another story. Right. And so I had a peripheral uh, relationship to it. But no, I didn't have to. I wasn't being called to testify. Yeah. Yeah, that's when. If this you, is if white you water to, stuff. This, that's what we're talking yeah, about. We're, well, and, yeah. I, 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 we, I, I started my, my career with Watergate and yeah. I wound up with Whitewater. Right. So it was a hell of a ride. The, um, no, but I, <clears throat> a lot of young people today, and I think this is totally unfair, yeah. they get sucked into the workings of the White House. And somebody doesn't protect them. You know, the general counsel doesn't protect right. them from conversations. Or they're asked to do things that are on the margins. Or they're told, uh, as, so in they Watergate, yeah. as in Watergate, as in Watergate, I had friends who were young like me, mm. who were in, you know, we were in tertiary positions. And we were told, well, here's what the law said. Nobody pays any attention to the law. This is the way politics is actually played. Yeah. You do this, you do that. You do these dirty tricks. That's what some of my friends were told. And they went to jail for it. Wow. And uh, they, so they, they I thought you've got to be very you careful. You've got to lawyer up. You've got to lawyer up. Yeah. But you've got to choose the person you're working for carefully. Yeah. yeah. And you've got to be willing to walk. Yeah. If you see things, don't say things. Get out. On that note, uh, yeah. so I, I read a 1993 Rolling Stone interview uh, with you. Okay. Uh, and in the interview, uh, the cookies were somehow involved. You <laughs> might have been eating them. Um, and so... I went ahead and made the assumption uh, that you like cookies. I do like cookies. And uh, otherwise you wouldn't be an American, right? Absolutely. Uh, okay, yeah, so yeah, we've especially, got, especially chocolate chip. We've got, oh, especially chocolate chip. Well, it's a good yeah. thing because I got, I got a lot of fun things here. <coughs> um, so we've got is, this is called a, this is called This a is a chocolate chip, yeah. Uh, th yeah, that's, uh, let's I see. think. It looks like a chocolate chip. It could be this one. Let me see. I got a. I have, How about I the brownie? The they're, they're usually the they, they're they're the ones I shouldn't eat. Um, I'm told that you put put some things in there sometimes. People got, walk out of here a little high. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I've, been uh, told, yeah, I've been told that I would. I would, I would you they're know. so high because they have such a great conversation. With me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had yeah. That I, I was told people. I'd have a marijuana cookie if I came over and visited you. We got oatmeal raisin, peanut butter, sugar cookie, cinnamon, snickerdoodle cinnamon. Yeah. We got M and M, chocolate chunk. Gee, um, you take your choice. I, you know, I'm gonna I, have some water. Okay, I have always been a fan of M and M's. I uh, love what they do, um, so I'm gonna go for the M and M cookie. You go for it. Um, I still think that's the chocolate chunk. Sure, that's right. No, that's a chocolate chunk. Uh, so, do you uh, people like all sorts of cookies? Uh, you're from the South mm -hmm. uh, originally. Is there a is there a Southern twist on the classic American cookie? Is there something that they like particularly down there? It is not true that we serve chocolate cookies with grits. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I know that was a rumor. Mm -hmm. um, chewy, hard. Do you have a do you have a preference? I prefer gooey to chewy. Oh, you like it quarter baked. Mm -hmm. I prefer it warm, actually. Mm. But these these seem fairly fresh. They're fresh. In fact, the peanut butter just came out of the oven <coughs> about thirty minutes before this interview. Here, right here at Harvard, there's a place you can get make peanut butter cookies, or did you bring them in? I went to an outside shop. There's a place they in did. Harvard Square called Insomnia Cookies, and they they <coughs> deliver until three a.m. You, ah. can, you can order. You can yeah. order your friend one cookie if you want. Oh, good. Um, although I'll they have to call. remember that. Um, yeah, they. What's do it that. called? Insomnia cookies. Insomnia cookies. Um, as the, the name. Do the cookies also keep you awake all night? They do actually. They told me I talked to them today actually that most of their orders for delivery come in at night, as uh -huh. you might imagine. People. Um, sure. Possibly people getting high, but wanting the cookies after they get high. <laughs> is, is the, well, yeah. well, maybe it's a way to get high. Fine. Uh -huh. Yeah. I really appreciate uh, how academic and highfalutin <laughs> the conversation has been. Well, thank you so much. This okay. has been a real pleasure. Okay. Uh, well, thanks so much. Yeah.